Avalon Hills Gettysburg 88 is a classic beer and pretzels war game. In today's video, I'm going to recreate the series replay that appeared in a 1989 issue of The General here on Legendary Tactics. This series replay had three narrators. Bruce A. Cluck, who is the Union player, Rex A. Martin, who is the Confederate player, and S. Craig Taylor, the designer, as a neutral commentator. Instead of me trying to put on different voices, I've asked the other boys at Legendary Tactics to lend me a hand. I will narrate the Confederate side, my colleague Flash will narrate the Union side, and Cax will narrate the designer's commentary. Here's a glance at the board setup, and without further ado, let's get started. Not much for me to do except watch what develops since I don't have any units on the board yet. This has got to be one of the few games around which doesn't start off with a bang as the aggressor attacks everything in sight. Trust Taylor's twisted mind to conceive of such a thing. Having never played Rex before, I'm not sure how he's planned to handle the first phase of the game, so I'll use Devon and Gamble in a delaying action. That way I can get as many units on Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill as possible. The Union on the first turn really has only one decision to make, whether to mass the cavalry under Buford, presenting the Confederates with the possibility of cutting them off or assaulting them en masse, or separating Gamble and Devon to screen the town and Wadsworth, risking defeat in detail of the two cavalry divisions. As expected, Devon did manage to delay the butternuts. They had to slow down to step over the bodies and dead horses. Bruce elects to fight a delaying action and I play it safe and simply take down Devon. With that, I expect him to fall back onto his arriving reinforcements. I hope to make the battle center around Cemetery Hill, forcing Rex to attack against a mass of units and the best possible defensive terrain. So all my reinforcements will be headed there with just a couple to guard the flanks. Bruce has left Reynolds hanging out to dry, and while I don't see why he did, I'll try to make him pay, hoping to leave the arriving First Corps leaderless and relatively ineffective. Heth merely moves to guard my flank with Pegram's guns in support. Remember, under the optional rule, artillery has a 2 hex range and can add its weight into the defense if not attacked itself. Heth does run a small risk of being attacked, but at this point the damn Yankees, as I've said before, where I was raised it was one word have more to lose than I in any even odds battle, notably so since I hold the initiative chit. Unfortunately, my attack on Reynolds doesn't accomplish anything worthwhile, and I am not about to relinquish the initiative chit on such a battle. For the next several turns, I grow in strength and have most all of the advantages. I'll save the chit for a game breaker, a moment of disaster or missed opportunity that can be put a right for the rebel cause and bodes to win the match. Oh no, I've been looking too far ahead and I forgot about Reynolds. Now I know it's been a while since I last played a war game. Luckily, he managed to hold out, so I'll move him to better cover. Reynolds is moved to Culp's Hill with the hope that Robinson can reach him in time before Rex attacks. And I'll try to make Cemetery Hill a blocking position to protect the Baltimore Pike. The situation is beginning to develop, and the strategies of each side are starting to be revealed. Leaving Wadsworth dangling out in the open was an obvious error, but the dice were such that it had no effect. Not unexpectedly, Bruce is going to make me fight for Cemetery Ridge and so packs it end to end with Bluebellies, and he moves Reynolds with Wadsworth to hold Culp's Hill, the only appreciable force that can reach it. Too bad for him Robinson hasn't the movement. It takes three movement points simply to enter the hex to reinforce them. It does seem to me that he should have evacuated Reynolds back to the main body. Commanders in this game can be crucial if you expect to be able to mass troops in a hex, otherwise only one piece can occupy a location. Thus Hill and the newly arrived E will assault Culp's Hill, getting the best result possible for me. I normally don't like making purely infantry attacks with my big confederate divisions, since any step loss can be devastating in terms of combat power. But this fleeting opportunity is too good to pass up and I have the initiative chit to try and salvage the situation if my die is cold. But I luck out and gain my first significant victory points, six, of this playing. Hill's advance ensures that the hill remains mine. 
Reynolds is out of luck and he's killed in the first major Confederate attack. Well, at least he lasted longer this time than he did on his visit to Gettysburg. Meanwhile, I strengthen my position at Cemetery Hill with Stenware in reserve. I've not enough strength to attack and this is about all I can do without Reynolds to command First Corps. Buford is the sacrificial victim to slow Rex down. Note that in the rebel attack on Culp's Hill, Wadsworth does not get the plus one modifier for the woods in the hex. That's because they are connected with the woods in hex N9, containing some of the attackers. By George, that just may have been why Rex put them there. Good show. The loss of Reynolds will hurt the Union effort for the remainder of the game, since option 10C1, where lost generals are replaced at night, is not in use. The two-step loss that led to the elimination of Wadsworth's Infantry Division and General Reynolds Headquarters Unit. Headquarters are eliminated if caught alone or if all combat units with which they are stacked are eliminated. Points out that it is usually a good idea for frontline generals to accompany forces that can withstand at least a three step loss to avoid these sorts of worrisome disasters. Virtually the entire damn Yankee army forms a phalanx on Cemetery Ridge, but I think he erred in leaving Buford and Gamble at the point. On the other hand, this cavalry screen may just be to ensure that Howard remains a viable force. At best, Howard and two units would only be three strength points better than what he has here. Regardless, I'll let Lee dust them off the hill. Meanwhile, Anderson guards both my flank and the troopless Longstreet, and Ewa moves to the other flank to play games with Bruce's composure by threatening the Baltimore Pike entry and VP hacks. Too bad Buford escapes. No particular reason for Lee to occupy the hill yet, and why invite a Union counterattack? I prefer him as passive as he has been thus far. Early ensures that any attack on Lee is made from two hexes only, meaning an even strength attack at best for them Yankees. Here they come. As Lee positions himself for the attack on Cemetery Hill, I must try to hold the hill and get reinforcements to it to anchor my line. Meanwhile, having survived the assault, I feel confident that Buford will be able to get to the Baltimore Pike and hold there. Hancock hangs around to wait for somebody to command. So far, no butternut losses. The Union player may be playing well defensively, but Confederate plays have been moderately cautious so far also. Passive is certainly the operative word here as Bruce does little except extract Buford to guard the pike in I-11 and hold Hancock near Little Round Top. Now I can launch my own attack to clear Cemetery Ridge. Ewell cuts the Baltimore Pike and threatens to overwhelm Buford while Early marches to join him. Jenkins too. The rest guard my right flank, hopefully extending the enemy line. Otherwise I'll outflank him and could reach the round tops. Longstreet twiddles his thumbs. My attacks go as well as can be expected, and I've smashed up Howard's core a bit in the bargain. Unless he counterattacks, I should be able to have the ridge complete next turn, and can then ready myself for the inevitable end of day Union counterattack. The dice have not been good to me. I must break contact, and I must slow Ewell up or he will cut off the pike and cause my arriving reinforcements all sorts of problems. Slocum attacks.
At last, some life from the damn Yankees' last turn as Slocum and crew look to thwart Ewell's advance. But my stout boys hold out and make him pay. The rest of Bruce's forces break contact, knowing I'm not going to stick Lee or Hill so far forward, and he cleverly positions Doubleday to try and contest the 1vp hex. I'll fight him for that point since I've some 14 VP and just two more means I'll double the VP he has. The Rebs need twice the number of enemy VP to grab an automatic victory at the end of the first day. And since there can be no combat, usually at night, he'll have only one shot left to save himself. If nothing else changes, I could win the game here and now. Ewell will strip off Wainwright. The classic soak off tactic is in full force in Gettysburg 88. Longstreet goes to Gettysburg Town so he can reach his arriving troops next turn no matter where I commit them. The attacks go very well, bringing my VP total to 19 points. Too bad I had to sacrifice the initiative chit to save Lee being embarrassed, but this could be the game breaker I spoke of earlier. Now to see what Bruce can do to try and save the day. Make no mistake, this game can be swung tremendously by the combat die rolls. Having that chit allows one to gamble a bit and ensures that the enemy must suffer whatever you can do to him. It very much encourages offensive play, for a while. Regardless, I have an impressive line of troops, nice and straight, in excellent terrain. Let them blue bellies come. Now I'm forced to strike and hope to cause as much damage as possible, but the dice haven't been good to me so far. On the other hand, now I have the initiative chit, and that helps considerably when planning how to snatch, if not victory, at least a delay from the jaws of defeat. State's Right Martin has had good luck so far to avoid giving up the initiative chit. Point-wise, the Federals are now in desperate straits. Anderson was left forward with no backup. When the smoke cleared, the field was littered with Rebs, and that should keep the game going into a second day. But this turns two even odds Union attacks work beautifully. The Union is saved for now. Oh me god, I knew the moment I used that shit it would return to haunt me. I goofed. I shouldn't have gotten cocky and left Anderson so far forward unsupported. At least Ewell had the good sense to retreat without losing a step. The loss of Anderson's division gives a final VP tally of Confederate 19, Union 13, meaning I've probably lost my best shot at winning this game outright. This is the perfect example of how an adverse die roll can dramatically affect the powerful but brittle Confederate army. Worse yet, now hordes of Yankees pour onto the field. All I can do this turn is put my killer stack under Longstreet together, ensure I hold Culp's Hill and Cemetery Ridge as strongly as possible, cover my right flank, and position myself for a grand assault at dawn. At last, my significant reinforcements start to appear. Now it's time to get positioned to change tactics drastically. Ewell wisely decided to pull back, but Rex has made Cemetery Hill look very formidable. The enemy line suddenly starts to look rather imposing. Some hefty stacks and the 2vp hex is well guarded. He even has some reserves. My own position on the other hand looks rather thin. Now my maneuver must be a great deal more cautious as any mistake could see one of my big groups surrounded and annihilated by a pack of pygmies. It's going to be a real slugfest now.
I'm not sure what purpose Osborne's sacrifice serves, but I'll accept it. My other two stacks look to crack the Union position guarding the Baltimore Pike, while my center holds the edge of Cemetery Hill. Osborne's battery is overwhelmed, but that damn Muhlenberg cost Pegram a step loss. Bruce does use the initiative chit to save Slocum's troops, but is still forced to retreat. However, at this point, I don't dare advance with Ewell. Slocum's attack lost steam and the chit had to be used during the Reb counterattack. It did save the troops, but he's still forced to retreat. I simply can't afford to lose him now. He'll be needed later. My own attacks are simply jockeying for position and to keep Rex off balance. Just wait, Rebs. Things are going to change real soon. Worm turns. After playing it cautiously for most of July 1st, mild mannered Billy Yang seems to have changed into his supersuit and is instituting an attrition strategy of constant attacks to wear down Johnny Reb. None of these draw blood this turn, but the initiative chit is now in federal custody. Heavy Union attacks on both flanks force me back a bit and draws the initiative chit to maintain Longstreet's powerful force in being, but it costs the damn Yankees another unit, Randolph, small though it may be. Obviously he used Randolph to keep Nelson out of the battle, but his defensive fire wouldn't have made a speck of difference anyway. However, I note a dangerous trend here. Whereas the first day Bruce tried to play a defensive strategy until the imminent threat of losing drove him to desperate and successful measures, now he has become a veritable tiger, attacking and attacking any weak point, and some not so weak. Add to this new attitude the fact that he is a fine gamer, a quick learner, and is starting to have some powerful stacks of his own, just look at Sickles and Hancock, and I could be blood white. I too look to the flanks to break things open, attacking Howard on my right, Sykes on my left, with Jenkins peeling Martin off. But I've no reserve to speak of and that rather worries me since I like insurance in case of mistakes or bad luck. But no time to worry about it now as blood flows freely at each end of my line. Unfortunately, Lee and Ewell and the main assault are driven back. The time has come. Now I intend to throw everything at him. Hopefully I can shock his line enough to break through somewhere. I have units in reserve to plug any that open in mine. It's time for some real bloodletting.
damn it, to coin a phrase. Once he has the idea, Bruce is deadly. My Texans are dead. Johnson is shot to hell, my right flank virtually gone, and Sickle's monstrous mob is rolling onward. In the center I fare better, but it is only luck that early held out. To give you an idea of the intensity of the combat at this stage of the game, the round just finished saw the initiative chit change hands three times, and our lost strength points, counting those units KIA and flipped over, are dead even. A lot is going on this turn for me as I scramble to recover. Johnson retreats, hoping to get out of the line of fire. Nelson falls back to guard the town. Meanwhile, I again attack Sykes, trying still to get to the VP hex on the Baltimore Pike. I'm going to drive Hancock back off my hill. I can't let him have a toehold here to exploit or my whole position can become untenable. All goes well. Of course, I hold the chit, so there's not much Bruce can do about my hot die. Rex hammers back and I take some significant casualties, but things are still looking good for me. Hood has been terminated, Johnson has been sent scurrying, and Sickles is hunting for more targets. Again, the blue lines roll forward to strike all along the line. There has been a lot of bloodletting these past couple turns, but I have to question some of the Union attacks. Given even rolls, roughly even, say with the combat modifiers within two of each other, attacks are unlikely to cause many casualties, just lots of retreats. The barely touched Confederates retreat at the end of one turn, only to come roaring back with the high differential attacks at the start of the next. The Army of the Potomac can win a battle of attrition with the Army of Northern Virginia, but they have to keep the losses closer. Phew, another all-out assault by the damn Yankees. Looks like Bruce is trying to blow this game wide open. He even ignores the shut up Johnson to attack my most powerful stacks. This time around I suffer on the left but prevail on the right, and I hang tough with that initiative chit so I can pay him back, hopefully. Only two attacks this time, looking to blitz Tyler and Slocum. I've got to kill a bunch of these little units to tip the balance in my favor, otherwise he's going to eventually wear my army down. Already I have several endangered units and his pressure on Cemetery Ridge is increasing. Despite my success this turn, the rebel line is awfully thin. If it cracks, my southern patriots could be swarmed under. It is definitely the time of crisis for the South.
Once more into the breach. I have to break down those horrible stacks of his. They're the main target now. I have no real interest in capturing terrain, but they're too strong. The attacks on both the right and the left went well and forced Rex to use the chip to try to save Yule. It's the midpoint of the game and things look grim for the good guys. My artillery has been shot apart and I gave up the initiative chit in a futile attempt to keep Ewell a viable threat. At the moment I can claim only 26 VP while Bruce can claim 27 VP. The tide may have turned but I've got a couple of good shots left and now's definitely the time to take them. It's the hour for some fancy reorganization and battlefield heroics. First, I must ensure that I hang on to Culp's Hill to anchor my line, such as it is, so Ewell's survivors make their way there. Stewart arrives amid great celebration to plug the middle. Pickett relieves poor Johnson in holding the right flank. Then, Hill and Longstreet counterattack the damn Yankees, not so much for territorial gain, but to smash up Bruce's units. Make a note, boys, we're out for blood now. I will be making a concerted effort to attack his units with step losses, seeking to maximize my VP for casualties since there is little chance I will ever reach F6 or I-11. The die rolls are going cold, but more reinforcements are coming. I have to get some relief to my battle-weary boys if I intend to hold off what looks to be a very serious onslaught. All I managed to do is thin the enemy ranks a bit more. This may be enough in a battle of attrition.
Every time I kill a blue belly off, another three show up. Bruce's grand charge against the center of my line costs me some more artillery, drives me back along the entire line, but takes the initiative chit away from him. Despite all but the worst of misfortune, I won't give it up again, for its possession allows Bruce to avoid the hammer blows I'm planning with Lee and Hill. But first, I again shuffle my units to put together another big stack under command of the aforementioned Lee, and I strike to break up Meaty's rather weak mass and to annihilate the impetuous Slocum. The fact that Slocum is covered by the massed horsed artillery under Pleasanton doesn't deter me. Stuart joins in to take Slocum's hill advantage away. On the strength of powerful rebel divisions and poor Yankee die rolls, I smash the Union center and reclaim Cemetery Ridge entire. This was my own version of Pickett's charge and couldn't have had better results. On the flanks, I just position my units as well as possible to hang on as long as possible. Slocum has been trampled. Things have definitely swung the other way and are looking decidedly grim for the Union. Even more so when my attacks fail to make any impression. After losing the southern end of Cemetery Hill, the boys in grey retake it. At this point, with only one more daylight turn and a 42-29 victory point lead, can Rex hold Cemetery Hill's VP and gain an attrition lead that can win him the game? A 15 point lead being required at the end of July 2nd. Bruce is one stubborn fellow, but I can't fault his logic. If he is to have any hope of victory, he must break up those two big stacks of mine. So he mounts the best attacks he can and prays to dice it out. Lee, even though supported by Beckham's guns, is driven back. But Bruce has learned not to stick these guys into my space and doesn't occupy the slope. Now it's my last shot before night falls again and cools the bloodlust that fires my men. Lee and Hill attack while I'm going to try and hold the hill with my cavalry. F. Lee, rather than occupy the better terrain at K7, moves to L6 to ensure that, first, he can be hit from only one hex, and second, that any enemy in K7 can't be involved against Hill or Stuart. This is one instance where I'll pass up the benefit of defending a slope. The same sort of logic applies to my positioning of Chambliss. In battle, I managed to take down three steps out of the four possible and two attacks, so I'm satisfied. Again, I am in a position to win this game. 
the Confederate player needs 15 VP more than the Union to claim an automatic victory at the end of the second day. For I have 45 VP to Bruce's 29. So if nothing should change during his upcoming desperate dusk attacks, I win. Fat chance. His monster stacks still hold the high ground. They have to be damaged if there's to be any hope whatsoever. With nightfall approaching, I hope to be able to close with the enemy since they must retreat away from me. Again, up the slopes of Cemetery Hill, the brave boys in blue advance. The attack certainly gets results, but not quite the results I wanted. Wrapping himself in the grand old flag, Bruce leads his blue coats forward. The acrid smell of gunpowder, the glint of cold steel, the rattle of fickle dice. There is some real Union progress, and Cemetery Hill has been pounded real good. However, as the day ends, both armies could be added to water and used as paste. With Bernie drawing Lee's attention and most notably McIntosh's fire, Bruce seeks to drive me off the hill. It only half works. The crucial attack on hill is a failure, but Bruce drives off the cavalry and so moves on to Cemetery Ridge. Ironically, hill is isolated in enemy zones of control, but adjacent to only one enemy occupied hex and so must attack. On the other end, however, fate catches up with Longstreet and his command is butchered. I was mightily tempted to use the initiative chit here to try and save him, but decided to hold it in case I needed it for Hill or Lee. So right now the ledger shows the Rebs with 41 VP and the Yanks with 34. Not enough for a victory yet. And now I must fall away from the Bluebellies. I'll accept Hill that is. Damn, but my right flank looks pathetic, and the middle is not much better. But Hill does kill off Meaty's group. However, Hill can't advance into an enemy zone of control at night, so he stays put, claiming only one VP. End of day total, Confederate 45, Union 34. Hill got trapped on the hill by himself, and just like a cornered animal, he goes wild and inflicts damage on the nearest target, Mead, a lot of damage. But Longstreet and his horde are retreating, having been laid waste. I can't reinforce the hill, but I hope to reorganize and regroup for another round of intense combat on the third day. I've managed to avert another automatic victory. Now, I have to have some real luck for the outcome of the third day, and the game is settled by a simple majority of points. One high point. I did manage to get the cavalry around the lines to bother Rex's tattered troops on the far end. It's always darkest before the dawn and the inability of A.P. Hill to withdraw forces allow Little Powell to swarm over the boys led by old Snapping Turtle himself. The inverted infantry divisions of Hayes and Robinson are both lost, along with, more seriously, Army Commander Meade. 
I think Bruce made a serious mistake here, getting too wound up in the fighting and missing an opportunity to avoid the loss of Meade. As army commander, Meade can keep any two Union units together in one hex. This stack could have included Hayes, two combat factors, and any one combat factor backprinted artillery units, say Fitzhugh. With that extra step, Meade would not have been lost. Bruce spends the night tidying things up on his side of the board. My dawn attacks on Hancock and Sykes are made just to cost him some casualties. Both my attacks have units that I can afford to take step losses with, just in case things go awry. But both are successful. Stewart advances to protect the shot up Nelson. I haven't got that many units left that I can afford to risk any unnecessarily. My right flank is still a worry, but nothing much I can do about it. If Bruce smashes through there, I'll retreat towards Oak Ridge and Barlow's Knoll. All I need is to have more VP than he at the end of this day, and I'm far enough ahead that I feel confident. Well, my lines are looking rather tattered, but as far as that goes, Rex's aren't looking too good either. It's been a hard-fought and bloody game. My cavalry goes on the attack looking to pick off damaged unit, as does Howard. Any losses he takes help my position, and maybe one could break through. I must again attack the strong stacks under Lee and Hill. If nothing else, I have to keep them away from the fighting to the west of the town. As July 3rd dawns, the Union has its work cut out for it. At the end of the third day, the winner is the side with the most victory points. The current point spread is such that to win, there must be lots of grey casualties, preferably concentrated in their infantry divisions, that they have already lost a step. For example, one or more loss on a big unit like Rhodes Division changes one victory point to six. Retaking objective hexes can also cause big swings. For example, retaking Culp's Hill would add three Union and subtract three Confederate victory points, a six-point swing. Both options will be hard to accomplish as Federal losses in general officers make massing for killing attacks difficult. Confederates can win just by holding their losses down and not losing too much ground. Again, Bruce assaults all along the line, but there is a persistent note of desperation in his low odds attacks. Except for the assaults on Stuart and Pegram, not much success for him. In effect, our losses during his player turn balanced out. But the danger to my right flank, even with only cavalry threatening it, is too much to ignore any longer. I've got to do something to break up this mass of equestrians. So Lee wheels to take on Kilpatrick with Johnson along to up my odds. Ewell finally leaves the shelter of Culp's Hill to ambush Newton. Hill takes on Sykes to try and leave Bruce no force to speak of on that flank. Jenkins diverts Huey. My center is thin and I could lose a couple of units there, but if my attacks go as hoped, Bruce will only have Sedgwick to pound on me with any kind of combat advantage. And I've some reinforcements coming now, more than he. These should serve to plug any gaps while Lee and Hill whittle him down. I'll use Stuart to hold Culp's Hill and Ewell will then pick off any singleton damaged units he can reach. I feel sure now, especially after my luck with these attacks.
This is bad. Very bad. Lee and Johnson have stopped my cavalry. My own attacks misfire. I've done them no damage. Not to mention that Rex now has fresh troops arriving on the field. It's time to gather my commanders. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we have no choice now but to return to Washington while we still have some semblance of an army left. Although I didn't manage to destroy Lee's army, I don't think they'll follow us. They've been too badly hurt. We'll meet General Martin again. Count on it. Union losses this turn make it extremely unlikely that Bruce could pull it out. So a concession is the essence of good sportsmanship. To recap, I've already made my most telling points on Union play during my comments on earlier turns. I really felt that Rex played the first day too conservatively, but it's hard to argue with success. I think Bruce's decision to concede was virtually inescapable. Discounting the VP on the map board, I've amassed 51 casualty VP to the 29 he can claim. Add this to the ones I might well take down this turn, Howard's group in front of Lee, along with whatever I can do on the left. At that point, I think I can give him the onboard VP, retreat off the map, and still win. So it looks hopeless for the Union, although my army is too battered to chase these Federals back to Washington. In looking back on the game, I can't fault Bruce on his play. Perhaps my only comment might be that he failed to pressure my units with a step loss as much as he might have. On the other hand, if he ignored my big stacks or tried to screen them, they might have gone berserk and broken through to Little Round Top or the Baltimore Pike. Gettysburg 88 is a game, simple as it might appear, of fine balance, challenging strategy, many critical decisions, punch and counterpunch between two forces with significant differences, and luck. Overall, although I can't prove it, it did seem that the lady favored me this time, especially on the third day. A most enjoyable evening. The playing time for this game is a pleasant change of pace for those of us with a home life. We'll have to do it again someday soon. Mr. Taylor has managed to do exactly what he set out to do. He's produced a game that is low in complexity, fast-paced, and downright enjoyable. The fact that it is also a fine contest between the players is an added bonus. I think that, given a bit of luck on my part, or some bad on Rex's, the Union could have pulled this out. It certainly looked that way to me during the course of my second day, anyway. Looking back over all the moves I made, I can't say that I made too many that I consider mistakes. The odd loss here and there that I could have avoided, and a couple of missed opportunities perhaps. But I doubt that I would have played this much differently than I did, given the luck that I had. In any case, given the short playing time involved, we can always sit down and knock off another game tonight and see. This is almost the perfect game for the beginner or the wargamer looking for something different.